what is your position in relation to preservation of Quran? Is, for example, Hafsa and Asim, the way Hafsa and Asim, do you see it as preserved, Munazzal from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Every single student of knowledge knows who studies Ulum al Quran that the most difficult topics are Ahruf and Qiraat. And the concept of Ahruf and the reality of Ahruf and the relationship of the Rathmatic Mus'haf with the Ahruf and the preservation of the Ahruf. Is it one? Is it three? Is it seven? And the relationship of the Qiraat to the Ahruf. This is a topic that when you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out. And you don't fully comprehend. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. And this isn't new. This is from the time of the Sahaba. This is not a joke, brothers and sisters. The issue of Ahruf and Qiraat caused confusion to somebody whom the Prophet said, if you want to listen to the Quran directly, listen to Ubay. Ubay is not some even average Sahabi. He is the Qari of the Quran. He is the master. He is who he is. And he goes, Fadakhal fi nafsi shak. Like, what is all of this stuff? Um, again, this is the you, you have asked me some very honest question. This is the first time I'm saying these things. Many people are aware who listen to my lectures that I've mentioned the crises that happened to me at Yale. Now, for the first time, I'm telling you here. What was the crisis? I mentioned it, referenced it, but I never explicitly said it. Why didn't I say it? Because it should not be said in public. This was not something I brought up in public. And I would never bring it up in public. And I don't think it is wise to bring it up in public. This was the issue. That the issue of ahruf and preservation and qiraat and relationships between them, these are very, very difficult issues. And the most advanced of our scholars they're not quite fully certain how to solve all of the unanswered questions in there. I don't want to get into that issue. Okay, fine. Why do I not want to get to that issue? Here's the point. These issues should only be discussed amongst people mm. who know what the qiraat are. What was the crisis? The crisis was very simple. And by the way, this is now a well-known open secret amongst many Muslim graduate students and, and, and academics around the world. And yeah. this is well-known. Traditional understandings of Ahruf and Qiraat cannot answer some of these pressing questions that are now being poked by our uh, people outside of, by our academics, not our, by their academics outside of the faith tradition. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit and then we'll say, okay, khalas, sami'na wa ta'na. And that's great, alhamdulillah. When you go to academia, they don't have that red line. And they're going to just, you know, the, 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 the famous story of the emperor with no clothes. They're going to just point out, no, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's not true, and this and that. And they'll bring issues, which I'm not going to mention explicitly, that you know are true because they're in your own books. They're not inventing anything new. They'll bring you riwayat, and they'll bring you athar, and then you add to that very well-known issues of, I don't even want to be explicit. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. More and more professors and academics are writing stuff and they're bringing forth issues. Their level of now knowledge is leaps and bounds above what it used to be, you know, 100 years ago, you know? And by and large, our ulama in the Eastern world are not aware, by and large, of what's going on in the Western side of things. And they're not answering those questions in a manner that it needs to be answered. And this is something all of us that are in academia fully acknowledge. This issue uh, of Ahruf and Qiraat has troubled the Ummah from the very beginning of times, nothing new. And there are 15 opinions about this. None of them fully answer all of the questions that are raised. Some of them answer more than others. So the issues of the relationship, of the origins, of the ikhtilaf and all of this should only be discussed amongst those who are familiar with this science. I can't answer this question in a 20 minute interview, nor is yeah, it wise okay, okay. to do so, which is why I never brought this topic up myself. You will not find one lecture of mine about this issue. It should never be brought up in public. This is not something you discuss amongst the masses, ya khi. It's not wise. You don't understand Qiraat, let it be. And that's why even when they accuse me, I didn't defend myself because I would rather people have doubt about me than the Quran. You can't handle the truth. What is happening in the last few years is not me anymore. It's the Western academics. These, these problems are now becoming mainstream. If I were to give you a blank mushaf, yeah, 
and uh, and tell you to write what is munazzal verbatim from Allah into that mushaf with no human interference, would you write something which corresponds? It's with not an easy answer. It's not an easy yes or no. After we get off this phone call, me and you, let's have a number of discussions. No problem. It is kalamullah. What, it is what, what, what would you write? Uh, 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 you let's not, let, let's, you, you're pushing me. All of the qira'at are the Qur'an. All of the qira'at are authentic. Alhamdulillah. Leave it at that, ya akhi. Beyond this, honestly, I have no problem. We'll have a discussion or take my class. This is no longer hidden news. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. If I were to give you a blank mushaf, yeah, and, uh, and tell you to write what is munazzal verbatim from Allah into that mushaf with no human interference, would you write something which corresponds? It's with not an easy answer. It's not an easy yes or no. We are generally introduced uh, and told that the Quran was to transmitted in such a manner that there were thousands of memorizers of the Quran. There were heaps and uh, there, were, there were such a large number of people who had memorized the Quran partially and completely. And then it, these memorizers had transmitted this, this memorized Quran to the next generation and so on and so forth. And such was this large number of memorizers of the first generation in the time of the Prophet that any transmission in, of, of error uh, was rendered as secure. When it comes to evaluating hadith, here we have uh, usually one uh, report about something the Prophet peace be upon him said or did or happened in his uh, presence. And that is usually transmitted from one person to another to another, um, and, and, and the chains of transmission can be counted usually. In the case of the Quran, the, it was not possible to count. There were so many chains. Mm -hmm. there, 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 there were so many people who knew uh, within the community. It was, it was like common knowledge uh, that this is how the Quran is and this is how it is read. And this quote is taken from one of the classical authorities we have, al Dharqani. He stated, the Quran is the Arabic speech of Allah, which he revealed to Muhammad in wording and meaning, and which has been preserved in the Mus'hafs, and has reached us by Mutawatir transmission. The standard narrative has holes in it. But on the contrary, we find a Muslim Hadith book as highly regarded as the Jamia Sahih of Imam Bukhari, presenting two narratives which which say that actually there were only four memorizers of the Quran who had memorized the Quran in the lifetime of the Prophet. And uh, this is obviously in stark contrast with the claim that there were thousands of memorizers. In the case of the Quran, the, it was not possible to count. There were so many chains. Actually, there were only four memorizers of the Quran who had memorized the Quran in the lifetime of the Prophet. Uh, it is reported by Anas ibn Malik. He says, Matan Nabi. And then he names those four persons. Abu Darda, Mu'az ibn Jabal, Zayd ibn Sabat, Abu Zayd. So it says that these are the four people. Only it's, it, it, the, the, the style is very restrictive. It says, Lam yajma'il Quran ghayru arba. Only three, four people had memorized the Quran. I'm saying memorized because most of our scholars interpret this narrative, the word jam'ah, to be, to connote memorization. And has reached us by Matawatir, Transmission. Actually, there were only four memorizers of the Quran who had memorized the Quran in the lifetime of the Prophet. What is all of this going on here? The way the Quran is arranged is the way that the Prophet ﷺ left it for us. Jibreel, the angel Jibreel, taught Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam the order of the chapters. Yes? And Zayd ibn Thabit, he witnessed that. So he also knew the order that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam learned from Jibreel and also the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam taught it to other companions. This standardization comes from the Prophet himself. Even, even the, the, the order of the surahs and the verses. The standard narrative has holes in it. Um, when it comes to the order of chapters themselves, um, uh, some of this seems to have been based on the judgment of, uh, or the knowledge of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. 
The way the Quran is arranged is the way that the Prophet ﷺ left it for us. Some of this seems to have been based on the judgment of, uh, or the knowledge of the companions of the Prophet. This standardization comes from the Prophet himself. And they collectively, unanimously standardized the text of the Quran which we read today. The, the uh, order of the Quran, Quranic surahs in Abdullah ibn Masood's codex and of uh, Ubay ibn Kaab's codex is being displayed before you. And this has been brought to surface by Ibn Nadim's al-Fahrist and uh, Suyuti's al Khan, and they have displayed uh, this arrangement in their own books and said that this is how the Quran was arranged in the companion codices. Again, this question uh, struck me that uh, if uh, the Quran had a different arrangement at different companions and the Quran of Usman again had a different arrangement, then which is the correct arrangement? Uh, the, the Sahaba's uh, codices, yeah. for example, codices uh, as ascribed to Abdullah ibn Ubay, Abdullah ibn Masood, Ali, Ali Ta'ala and whom all of them differed with each other uh, mm -hmm. as they have reported in our history books. We have certain scribal errors in the Quran and this is uh, something which every single scholar acknowledges. Even the earliest versions of the Quran have these scribal errors. There are numerous examples in which we can see these scribal errors in which an extra va or extra ya or an extra alif is found in, in these uh, uh, versions of the Quran. Extra alif, can you believe that? Extra alif. <laughs> this is just crazy textual criticism. I'm not even going to address that. Extra alif and wow and fa, you know, anyone knows spelling differences, scribal styles may differ, may vary. It's about the contents. Uh, this is verse of Surah Naml has uh, extra alif contained in it. Uh, the words are la azibannahu azaban shadida aw la azbahannahu. As you can see, the underlined word, uh, the, uh, the alif, which, uh, which uh, actually succeeds the other alif, is an extra alif because the word is la azbahannahu. Or uh, if we don't uh, accept this to be a redundant, uh, to be something, a letter which is redundant, then uh, we find this anomaly that this word would disperse or this word would read in a very opposite way. Extra alif and wow and fa. It's about the content. Uh, we find this anomaly that this word would disperse or this word would read in a very opposite way. And the words would be, awla azbahannaw. It, it will be a negative particle instead of presenting the positive uh, picture. Extra alif and wow and fa. It's about the content. Similarly, another example is from Surah Ali Imran. This is verse 158. And here again we find an extra alif. Uh, the words are wa muttum aw qutiltum la ilallahi tuhsharun. The first of these alif uh, uh, is, uh, or the second of these alif is redundant, uh, and uh, it has to it has to be subtracted from reading or deleted from reading. Otherwise, uh, we'll have an opposite meaning. La ilallahi tuhsharun would mean that uh, it is it, it is for sure that uh, people uh, shall be gathered before the Almighty. But if we read it with the second alif as well then the verse would become la ilallah and we shall not people or you should not be gathered before the almighty so you can see there is an exactly opposite meaning other than uh, the, uh, these examples uh, there are numerous examples in which we can see these scribal errors in which an extra va or extra ya or an extra alif is found in in these uh, uh, versions of the quran and it is not just the quran that we have today even the earliest versions of the quran have these scribal errors well we know that in hadith literature there are a hadith which tell us that uh, the Quran that we have is incomplete. Uh, the Rajam verse is a is a very typical example. It is called Mansukhu Tilawa Dunul Hukum, which mm. means that it is there. Yeah. Yes, the recital has been abrogated. Then we have the the the, the suckling verse, uh, which uh, uh, the uh, the mother of faithful Aisha said that uh, the Prophet had was had just died, and they still read that verse in the Quran. And we know we know that it's no longer in the Quran. Uh, today, most Muslims read the Quran in a text uh, that uh, is referred to as the Egyptian edition uh, of 1924. But this is not the only text of the Quran that is read uh, throughout the world. Currently, there are five different versions of the Quran found in the Muslim Ummah. When I say there are five versions, it means that there are five different versions, which have different words at times. There are verbs which are different. There are nouns which are different. There is a difference between a plural and singular. There are differences between declensions or the Arab, and then we have other differences.